minute, let me borrow your ear And I'll sing you a song about Leonard Peltier He's gone so long in a federal jail And there ain't no way that you could pay his bail In South Dakota where the fear has grown Where the president's a watch from a mountain of stone They say all people are free to roam There ain't no freedom in the Indian home a third, uh, a fourth victim in which the government had to have a scapegoat because of the, version, the diversionary tactic that they created to discredit our people through the media to get away with the acts of what they're now doing today and that's exploiting the resources from our land. Mm -hmm. And that was when the agents had made their play in a gunshot battle on a deadly day. And three men died in the hollow sand to FBI and an Indian man. I think many people always ask, well, why did the shootout happen? What was going on? But people just don't know that during that very same time period, Richard Wilson, who was then the acting tribal chairman, was in Washington, D.C., signing away one-eighth of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is 133,000 acres of land and valued at billions of do dollars of uranium deposits that are being strip-mined out of there by over 40 corporations today. The charge was set for homicide, but Leonard got away to the Canada side, where he lived for a while in the northern town, till they came up and got him and brought him back down. And today we have a liberation of Lakota people who have occupied 800 acres of land, which is now called the Yellow Thunder community, which is one of the richest areas in which the deposits are, are laying. Mm -hmm. And so the government is very uptight about this at this time. The judge and the jury, they both agreed. Two times murder in the first degree. They pounded the gavel and they rang on the bell. Two times life in a federal cell. Citations came from Washington. Congratulations on a job well done. Two agents gone is a mighty price, but if you want something bad, you gotta sacrifice. Now there's many books on, on domestic surveillance, on counterintelligence programs, I mean the Fred Hampton case. Those were real cases where police agencies violated civil and human rights and even according to their own ethics, violated law enforcement eth codes of ethics. People need to understand that that's true, those are facts, and if they ever allow us, for example, in the case of Leonard Peltier, very soon, we hope to prove that. And now Leonard Peltier is a captured man with both legs taken so he cannot stand. One more swallowed by the master plan to get their hands on the Indian land. Spotlight Leonard Peltier, a man who is recognized internationally as a political prisoner being held in jail in the United States. His story tonight on Alternative Views. Good evening. Tonight on Alternative Views, we're going to have an in-depth look at kind of two aspects of one subject, the Native American and how the Native American is treated in the United States. It has to do with civil rights. What happens when the U.S. power structure decides that, hey, we don't like these people? It results in political prisoners. Also, the program tonight will give us an insight into the thinking and culture of the Native American.
and how in touch with the universe and nature these people still are. We'll see that later in an interview with the cousin of Leonard Peltier, the political prisoner who is in jail. But first we'll have some news. I saw an article in the Christian Science Monitor about midway through August about Union Carbide and they've been having quite a bit of trouble. You may, may remember the incident in Bhopal, India where 2,000 people were killed and another 200,000 were injured. Well, shortly thereafter, they had a leak at a plant in Institute, West Virginia, and more than 130 people were treated for problems with their eyes, lungs, nose, and throat, and another 30 were hospitalized overnight. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is despite the Union Carbides going out and investing $5 million in safety devices for the Institute plant. They apparently didn't work as well as they thought they were. I th the One of the... Uh, salient points in this article, they mentioned that if this case is tried in a U.S. court, it could uh, very much undercut Union Carbide's claim that the Bhopal accident occurred because of procedural errors on the part of the Indian workers. In other words, the Institute accident could be used as evidence of a pattern of sloppy safeguards by Union Carbide themselves. Now, I also, uh, last March, I think it was, I cut an article out of the Wall Street Journal. I'm an inveterate newspaper cutter. And I hung on to it because I thought it might prove interesting eventually, and I think, uh, I think it proved, uh, proved me right here. The article is a front page story dealing with insurers. It seems that they're uh, shunning covering chemical and other pollution causing industries. Uh, this, actually, this dates back to 1982 when the EPA ordered hazardous waste facilities to get liability insurance against chemical accidents in the wake of numerous revelations. One, for instance, I reported on a couple of years back, one ent enterprising young uh, truck driver, he had a tank full of toxic waste to dispose of and he wasn't sure what to do with it, so he, all he did was open up the spigots on the back of his truck and drove up and down the highway until it was all gone. Also, they, they came out and said that they had to have insurance. Well, the problem is that in the last few months, remember this is in March, the pollution liability insurance field has virtually collapsed, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported. They said that rates have climbed 50%, 200%, and even higher. And on top of that, coverage has been curtailed sharply with maximums reduced to $10 million or less. And all but three or four of the 14 companies and pools that issued this kind of insurance have pulled out, including the number one company, that's Shan Morahan and Company of Illinois, who last year insured 30 to 40 percent of the market. One of the insurance men was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying, pollution claims hold out the prospect of widespread insolvencies among the major carriers of insurance for these companies. Environmental regulators keep trying to make insurers the cowcatcher on the regulatory locomotive. So what this boils down to is that the law still requires these companies to buy insurance, but now there aren't very many insurance companies that are really willing to to bet that they're not going to have accidents. Frank, you got something over there for us? Well, I hope so. <clears throat> Here are just a few little quotes from Reagan, some of you may have heard before. He came out on a little advertisement blurb for the magazine The Nation. Here's one I haven't heard. Reagan on the environment said, uh, there is today in the United States much more forest no, he said, there is in the United States today as much forest as there was when Washington was at Valley Forge. <laughs> That's a miracle. <laughs> and now we turn to the centerpiece of tonight's alternative views, the American political prisoner, Leonard Peltier. Remember many months ago when Andrew Young said, hey, we got some political prisoners in the United States. Everybody said, oh, not in the United States of America, the Stars and Stripes and all this. What an uproar. But that's about as far as it went. Nobody said, hey, Andrew, who are they? And uh, how do they happen to get there? Why are they political prisoners? We've talked quite a bit on alternative views about this subject. And tonight we're going to focus on one bona fide political prisoner in the United States, Leonard Peltier. You ever heard of him? Leonard Peltier. Perhaps not. The mass media haven't done too much on him, if anything. Well, we have two people who are going to fill you in on Leonard Peltier, what happened to him, 
how he was railroaded into prison, how the FBI was involved with tampering of witnesses, harassment, scaring of witnesses, doctoring of evidence, withholding of evidence, right up and down the line, right through the trial judge. Can this happen in the United States? Well, it already has. And who else more than Leonard Peltier? Well, we don't know yet. But we're going to look at Leonard Peltier tonight very, very closely. We have Raul Salinas, who is the representative from the Southwest region of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. And we're very privileged to have a cousin of Leonard Peltier, Steve Robidoux. Can you tell us first, for the people who don't know, the history of the Peltier case? Sure, I'd be glad to. Well, Leonard Pe Peltier, first of all, is a Lakota. He is a member of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, in which he is from the section of North Dakota. And presently, Leonard is in prison doing two consecutive life sentences for original charges, which were aiding and abetting in the deaths of two FBI agents on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which took place on June 26, 1975. Now, on June 26, 1975, there was a shootout that had taken place in which two FBI agents illegally entered the reservations to serve fabricated arrest warrants, which, were, which they were never able to produce in the trials, okay? Now, immediately upon the agents entering the reservation, they came in, two agents, one in each unmarked car, radios and heavy equipment, and immediately a firefight had broken out. As a result of a firefight that had lasted for approximately eight and a half to ten hours, there was two FBI agents and one Indian man by the name of Joseph Stuntz, who, who to this day has never, we have never had an investigation into the circumstances of his death. Immediately, the, the FBI put out to the media that militant Indians, uh, hostiles, terrorists who were trying to take over the reservations had killed two FBI agents and there was a manhunt out for these so-called Indians. Eventually, four men were arrested and charged with aiding and abetting in the deaths of two FBI agents. Leonard Peltier, Dino Butler, Bob Robidoux, and a young man by the name of Jimmy Eagle, who later the charges were dropped because he was the, he was the person in which the government had claimed their reason for going in with the arrest warrants, which was for assault and robbery, was their excuse. Uh, charges were dropped on him. Now. Leonard was underground for some time, facing already convictions through the media being put on the 10 most wanted list, even before he had went to trial, labeling him as a, as a cop killer, as a slayer. Um, when he was captured in Canada, Dino Butler and Bob Robert were captured in the United States, and they went on trial in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 1976, while Leonard went on trial in Canada, fighting political asylum in Canada. Uh, fearing that if he was returned back to the United States, he would not receive a fair trial or possibly be killed, um, and also in recognition as being a member of the American Indian Movement. He was one of the leaders of the American Indian Movement, yes. is that correct? Yes, he was recognized throughout many communities as, as an organizer for the people. Yes, he, he had a very responsible job and was recognized to that effect. Mm -hmm. Steve, but, what were some of the things he did in the American Indian Movement? What were some of his political activities that made him a target for the FBI. Well, I, I think one of the most important things to really clarify in a brief way is that through the years, people have labeled the American Indian Movement as militant and radicals to the media that was presented by the government agencies to the media. We, in turn, have had to survive this attack on our people because the whole philosophy of the American Indian Movement was to stand for the honoring of over 372 treaties signed with different nations in the United States and Canada, and, and which today have never been honored. Not only the, the honoring of the treaties, but the traditional forms of government of many nations, the philosophies of their culture and their spiritual ways within their own land base, which is very serious because we see through the system today that the education system of America has did nothing but not only destroy native people's language and took in their land base, but it's attacking people around the world, such as, we'd, such as we've heard tonight about uh, El Salvador. The people are struggling for their land and their rights, their, their rights to survival, and this is what the American Indian is all about today. I don't like to use the term American Indian, but people are educated to identify us like that, so we'll respect it that way to a degree. But regardless, 
These here were Leonard's duties to learn those traditions and those philosophies, but at the same time we had to deal with society in which our people have been forced to live on how we survive in this education system today, in the society on how we have to provide for our families. We have to learn an education to do this. And so in order for us to have equal rights, we're, which, we're, which were being denied minority people throughout every urban community in the country, uh, welfare programs, education programs, uh, halfway houses for offenders, orphanages for the children. Even our old folks were sent to foster homes because they, they, we didn't have nobody to take care of them. We couldn't even take care of ourselves, yet alone worry about the respect that we used to maintain for our elders and our children. See, so these are philosophies and these are experiences that Leonard had was going through at the time of all this this bad media that was facing our people struggling for these real changes. Indeed. He was a hunter and he was a provider. He Some, was a provider for the people. One of the more concrete uh, tasks that Leonard carried out, again, what Steve is referring to is the relocation of people from the reservations into the urban areas, especially during the 50s, uh, late 40s and 50s, where native people came to urban um, areas and, and the shock of being away from the reservation, uh, and then the lack of employment, the lack of skills, the alcoholism which runs rampant in Indian country, and when we say Indian country, we mean through the Americas. Uh, and so Leonard was, for example, in Milwaukee, an alcoholic counselor. Uh, he had a, a people's workshop of auto mechanics to work on people's cars that were on the trails and, and traveling uh, across the land. Um, to support uh, Indian people's causes. And so, aside from that, his spiritual duties, which encompassed being a pipe carrier and a sun dancer, um, enabled him to talk to some of our youth and always took young people with him on the trail, as we say, when he had to go do a job like speak or gather people for a fishing, uh, honoring fishing ceremony or, or those things. Uh, as part of what Leonard's work entailed. Getting back to the case then, the other people involved or charged were also acquitted. Of all right. charges, See, were yeah. they not? See, we were right at that part to where Leonard was fighting yeah. extradition in Canada. Now, Dino and Bobby were going on trial in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at that time, and they were acquitted on grounds of self-defense and misconduct of the FBI. Okay, it was proven even by Clarence Kelly's testimonies throughout that trial that they, that they did have a counterintelligence program designed on the American Indian Movement, and they did believe that they were, they were honest people struggling for social change and, and rights for their people. You know, I mean, we had all these positive energies come out, but see, we're dealing with a third, uh, a fourth victim in which the government had to have a scapegoat because of the, version, the diversionary tactic that they created to discredit our people through the media to get away with the acts of what they're not doing today, and that's exploiting the resources from our land. Mm -hmm. And because during that same time of the shootout, I think many people always ask, well, why did the shootout happen? What was going on? But people just don't know that during that very same time period, Richard Wilson, who was then the acting tribal chairman, was in Washington, D.C., signing away one-eighth of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is 133,000 acres of land and valued at billions of do dollars of uranium deposits that are being strip-mined out of there by over 40 corporations today. And today we have a liberation of Lakota people who have occupied 800 acres of land, which is now called the Yellow Thunder Community, which is one of the richest areas in which the deposits are, are laying. Mm -hmm. And so the government is very uptight mm -hmm. about this at this time because throughout their year's existence there, on April 4th, they have gained the support of not only international support, but over 40 congressmen who are now trying to pass a bill to the National Park Services to clear the land for the Indians' use. Because everybody knows that there's a big controversy about who really owns the hills. Does the United States government or does the Indian people? And how long can we be blind to, to go along with a government who has all the control of all the policies, law enforcement, the laws and everything to back them up? And, and how can these obstacles deny what is really true? Because the land does belong to the native people. They are the caretakers of the land and today we talked about treaties on how the treaties were designed to, as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers flow and there was night and day, that we would be able to use the land freely for our future generations. And that, today that we, treaty was what, 18, what, 60? 
I forget, what was the date? 1868? It, it was a few years mm -hmm. before that, because 1868 was a new treaty. Time. It was the last treaty. Mm -hmm. But regardless, see, and, and, and then the American people, and, inter and people internationally feel that the United States is honoring Indian people. And this isn't the case because they use us through what they call the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in which many of our traditional people do not believe. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is just a branch of the United States government that is funded through every other kind of little project on how they want to keep the assimilation and genocide going to destroy our language and our land. And that's what it's really all about, and they did a very good job of it. Because right now, living on the reservation, people think that we have it made and we're getting land lease agreements and money's coming all the time and the Indians can just kick back and take it easy. But this isn't so mm -hmm. because you go on to the reservation and you got the highest poverty in the country going on besides the ghettos and the communities. I mean, you know, it's the highest. You have, for gasoline, it's almost up to $2. For bread, it's over a dollar fifty in some of the stores. And yet all your stores and your ranches and all, all the people who are leasing the land from the Indians are white ranchers who have control of the politics that go on in the communities with your mayors and your different politicians that make up a, uh, a city council. You know, I mean, we have to deal with all these kind of confusions that completely take away from our lifestyles, our language. Just as sure as I'm sitting here talking English to you, I've been robbed my language. And this is a hurt feeling of, you know, it's a survival feeling, you know, and today our people on our, on our last stand to re-educate ourselves and to reclaim the land in the best way possible against all these laws and regulations of policies that have been put onto our people. It isn't a very job that we have to be forced to become citizens when we're already a nation of own in our own land. But yet we're not allowed to practice the freedom of religion and they talk to feel about the First Amendment of the United States that it has to be honored among all people, but we see every day that it's being denied us every day. And it's not only native people, because once you've taken a people and their land base and their language, then you've conquered the people. But you can never con you, you, you will never capture the true spirit of people's resistance to face the oppression that is being forced on them right now. Because just like the people in El Salvador, it's, an, it's a natural reaction that you must stand in defense of your land when you're an oppressed by an oppressor. It's your natural duty to stand up and defend yourself and to protect your land and to protect your women and children, such as Leonard Peltier was doing on June 26th, when men, women, and children and old people were running for their lives. As I understand it then, there was practically a reign of terror. Uh, it was a reign the, of terror. Among the goon squads at the, uh, on the with the with the people, Richard Wilson's people, in support of the, the and, Bureau of Indian Affairs itself. And it still it's exists true. today. Still? It, it still exists today because they're getting ready for some other moves or some kind of infiltration to discredit the people to make their move for the next big grab is what it amounts to. And how they use people, we're yet to find out, such as we did with Leonard and all the people related to his case. I mean, in a six-year process since Leonard's been incarcerated, I mean, it's going to be seven years since the shootout in mm -hmm. June this coming June. I mean, we we have a total of 12 people who have been killed. We've had we've had tens and hundreds of people who have been harassed and intimidated. And today it's continuing on with one key witness, such as the name of Little Poor Bear, who was an Indian woman out of the community of Allen on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, who the FBI had used to illegally extradite Leonard from Canada under false affidavits that they forced her to sign under a protective custody plan. And the, the, the tactic there was that members of the American Indian Movement and Leonard's of the, members of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee were going to go out and kidnap her, such as we were going to take the judge. We were going to get different government officials mm -hmm. in exchange for Peltier. And, and people have to remember that we're peaceful people. You know, we understand the laws and the pressures in which we're faced, that if we violate the law, we're going to be abused through the court system and through the federal prison systems. This is, our, this is automatic for our people because we've got heads banging against those cell bars every day that we're trying to free, such as uh, Richard Marshall, who is another person in which the government used the same woman, Myrtle Poirbear, to illegally convict Marshall because he was linked up with Russell Means' activism in relation to liberating the independent nation of Wounded Knee. Well, that, you know, yes. Whereas the other two American Indian movement leaders who were let off on the trial were able to use evidence of FBI misconduct in the whole trial. Leonard was not able to do this. No, he was not able to How do this. How come Leonard wasn't able to have the charges dismissed on the grounds of this FBI misconduct? And what wa was some of the FBI misconduct and some of the strange ca 
circumstances surrounding this case. Well, we, I think we can get into a lot of time there, you know. But Leonard, uh, he was a scapegoat. He had to be the scapegoat for, because, to make an example before the people that nobody gets away with killing law enforcement agents, no matter what they do in terms of police, police brutality in the communities and on the reservations and around the world as far as that goes. But Leonard was not given due process of law, none whatsoever, because Judge Benson of the trial, uh, the Federal District Court out of Fargo, North Dakota, was very open and very biased to every motion of proof that was made for dismissal, dismissal or a new trial, okay? He, he even went through such extremes that to state, even though we had proof to show that the FBI was lying, he would say the FBI is not on trial here, Leonard Peltier is. Okay, we have to go through instances to show the state of mind on how they, on how they psyched out the jury, okay, such as with bloody autopsy pictures that were taken of the dead agents. Now, it was after the second autopsy, because it was through the second autopsy that we not only find the bloody picture mess scene in which they wavered be before the jury's faces, but we come to find out that one, each of the agents just had a bullet in them, but yet the media put out information saying that the agents were slain and riddled with bullets. They and, you know, and things of this nature. And so they would wave this around. And today we have documents from the Freedom of Information Act files on the FBI files that were released to us mm -hmm. through that act. Uh, we have documents showing that the AR-15 and that they used in Dino and Bobby's trial as well as Leonard's trial. That's the isn't, rifle, right? That's, that's the machine gun. Machine is what, gun. Yeah, this is the one that's supposed to have riddled the bullets with agents. Mm -hmm. We have a document today showing that it, was, it wasn't even the gun. It was just an excuse gun to put in its place, okay? Let alone a 223 shell casing in which there were thousands of them. Uh, it wasn't even the, the, the shell casing that went into the gun they used as a phony. That was the fabrication of evidence. That was the fabrication part. of materials and evidence, exhibits as they call them in the, in the trial proceedings. And they also withheld evidence they, which would have cleared. Oh yes, uh, by all means. Completely. Well, it, it was all, regardless of the information acts, it was all proven through the original trial. But there was no due process, there was prejudice, racism, and they, they had to have a conviction and they did it very openly. Even after the, you know, the trial was over, Prosecutor Haltman would come out to the media and say that, that the American uh, court system did its duty to, pr to protect the violators who, who, who uh, offend the law. You know, I mean, it was really gross to take, but I mean, regardless, we've taken Leonard's case all the way to the Supreme Court to where our last chance today is what they call the writ of habeas corpus. And the writ of habeas corpus is what they call in legal terms a 2255 that has to introduce positive new evidence. So through the Freedom of Information Act files, we have that positive new evidence that only strengthens the old evidence, as well as exposing over 12,000 pages of FBI documentation, and, excuse me, 15. And then there's 12,000 pages that are still being withheld, which is very important. But at the present time, our, our attorneys have the writ into the typist, and it's ready to be filed very soon. Mm -hmm. And. So, but see, getting back to the writ of habeas corpus, which I really feel is important, is that it's Leonard's last leg for freedom, you know, to receive a new trial so he can gain his freedom. Because if we can't build awareness for people to become involved with constitutional rights in which we're all bound to, uh, those constitutional rights t today are being threatened to be chopped up, such as the habeas corpus right. Last year they had over 8,000 cases of writ of habeas corpus and almost every one of them were rejected or denied. If any of them did make it, then it had a little publicity behind it in order to give that, that picture to the people of the American minds that they were, doing their, they were doing their duty. But now they're trying to pass a law to do away with that right. Once you get to the Supreme Court, you ain't going to have any last legal, legal remedies to, to gain your freedom. You know? And so we're dealing with a lot of innocent people who've already been through these experiences and just gave up the spirit to just do their time. It was claimed by the prosecution that the bullet that killed the FBI agents came from Leonard Peltier's gun, whereas the actual analysis by the FBI laboratory itself indicated that the bullets that killed the FBI agents did not match the gun. Well, see, it was obvious this because... This is a significant piece of new evidence that oh, is a scandal that he was convicted on the basis of this false evidence and that the FBI withheld the um, evidence. And there was a second point, too, that it was claimed that an FBI agent saw Leonard Peltier shooting right. through a scope 
of his rifle, and it turned out that none of the rifles had a scope. Right, exactly. I was going to get into that a yeah, little bit, yeah. but plus the fact that even it was at night anyway, uh, or well, no, it was during the day. See, it, it was it happened in the early morning hours, and it mm -hmm. lasted way until into the to six o'clock in the afternoon to where they just had. I mean, here, you know, within minutes, within twenty minutes to a half hour. These guys are on the radio. Even the transmission radio calls and the reports were all fabricated, okay? The whole the whole story. Okay, now, within a half hour, here's the National Guard, the 82nd Airborne, Armed Personnel Carrier, State Police, City, County and City Police, BIA Police, automatically on the scene. And, you know, they, they had the, the few days from my investigations of the people, the, several weeks before, they had BIA police coming in and were staking out FBI agents to know the area. Okay, now they already had plans for what to was go on, what was to happen on June 26, 1975. And yet they talk about these bullets that were related to Leonard and his gun. I mean, we have to go back into simple realities of the firefight. There was a firefight had taken place. Who, 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 who killed Joe Stunts? You know, who really killed those agents has never been established. Leonard was originally charged with aiding and abetting with, along with all the defendants. But yet, when he was convicted in Fargo, they they just happened to put murder. He was he was convicted of two, two two, two counts of second degree murder. There's been a lot of international support and interest in this case, hasn't there? Oh yes, uh, in 1978, when Leonard's case was in the Supreme Court, was our first trip to Europe. Uh, myself and Lou Gerwitz, who was one of Leonard's attorneys at the time. Our whole purpose was to go to Amnesty International in London to see if we wouldn't, couldn't get them to uh, adopt Leonard as a political prisoner of conscience. We were very lucky to go there because they had Leonard's case buried under the table because mm -hmm. throughout all the processes of his trials, appeals, everything, all they were was observers, okay? Because they, when you're dealing with Native Nations, Na Native Nations is the only race of man that has not, never been supported by Amnesty okay mm -hmm. because of technicalities that I'd like to get into a little later briefly but we went to London and we were able to explain their their reasons why they denied Leonard's case okay why they were quiet with it and it was because of their violence so when we explained the self-defense and the attack on the people they had different point of views to where they gave us a five-point letter of the main points on why the Supreme Court judges should allow Leonard a new trial Okay, but regardless, we were still denied the Supreme Court, but throughout that process now, Amnesty also come up with other excuses that uh, they couldn't do it because of technicalities after we cleared the violence concept, okay? So the, the, whole, the whole analysis of, to put it really briefly, is why they can't support Leonard's case technically is because you're dealing with a nation of people who are not recognized as a nation of people by an oppressed government, the United States government, under treaty law. Mm -hmm. And today that comes to be fact because we look at El Salvador, we look at Puerto Rico who is struggling for nationhood and we see how they mis miscredited the, the, the freedom the nationalists of Puerto Rico by putting them as terrorists and militants, you know. I mean, it's people's ways they speak out and for sure it's wrong. But how else do you get the attention of all the people who are out just worrying about their <coughs> lifestyles and don't have time to become involved with serious things? Well, serious well, issues, you know. Well, well, you've been to Geneva and the UN uh, about this case. Can you tell us about what about your experiences there? Yes. Well, um, after the trip to uh, uh, London to Amnesty International by Steve and one of our attorneys, uh, Lou Gerwitz, uh, there was a gathering at the Fourth uh, International Bertrand Russell Tribunal at which Steve again addressed uh, the body there. Later, I was asked uh, by the Defense Committee to represent our group, represent Leonard in Geneva. I traveled with the International Indian Treaty Council as a delegate of the Treaty Council, but as a representative of Leonard Peltier and the committee. I was able to address the entire body on two occasions. The International Treaty Council has non-governmental organization status, which is a non-voting, but yet there is a voice. And so I was one of the delegates to speak of, of the delegation. I addressed the entire body regarding Leonard Peltier. And I was also <laughs> able to come in because of my presentation uh, regarding Leonard and other native political prisoners uh, Dickie Marshall, Rita Silk Nonai, uh, David Ruiz, uh, 
it created, along with the question of the indigenous people in Nicaragua, it created such an interest at the United Nations commissions that we were given a special session for political prisoners at that point. I elaborated and, and made some concrete requests of the international bodies that they take on some, some plans of action regarding Leonard Peltier. We were, believe, very successful in that the president of the uh, body there, Roma Chandra uh, from India, ended the conference by alluding to the symbol that Leonard had become to, uh, to the people by the witnessing of how the many representatives of Native nations uh, conducted themselves there in Geneva, and he ended the entire session with a poem that Leonard wrote in, in a British Columbia prison entitled, I Am the Indian Voice. As a result of that uh, successful meeting, as a result of us very clearly standing alongside the Sandinista government in their explanations of the question of indigenous people, which U.S. propaganda machines have tried to uh, portray in other ways to us here, we were, the International Indian Treaty Council was invited to Nicaragua uh, in December where the um, Third Assembly on Racial Discrimination, um, Recourses and Procedures on Racial Discrimination was held. Um, and again, I was asked as a representative of the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee to serve as interpreter and translator uh, for the International Treaty Council. I did not, I was not able to present uh, to the entire body, but since we were guests of the Nicaraguan government and we had been very personal friends of Comandante Lumberto Campbell, um, I was able to do a, a very um, detailed and in-depth interview presentation on Sandino TV uh, regarding the case of Leonard Peltier and David Ruiz and Rainy Street here in Austin. So it was very mm -hmm. successful and we have people that we have now, we don't have a committee there in Nicaragua, but we certainly have an information center where we send all our materials and they're disseminating it. And a lot of Nicaraguan children are wearing free Peltier t-shirts and so it was very beautiful. Well, this Peltier case is part of a mainstream of, of violation of civil rights and genocide against Native Americans for years and years, but it's also part of the continuation of COINTELPRO program by the FBI, which has been going on for many, many decades against people of all uh, races and colors and uh, ways of thinking. Right. That's exactly what we're about, talking to people wherever we go all over this country and all over this world. We're trying to say to people, hey, you don't know that there was an Operation Bicent in 1976 when we were going across the country to Washington, D.C. to articulate our grievances to the U.S. government, directed primarily at the American Indian Movement and other uh, terrorist groups, as they called it. Uh, <laughs> We also need to have people understand that the U.S. government and its law enforcement agencies against Native people had something called Operation Garden Plot and Operation Gar uh, Cable Splicer. People need to understand that these are not figments what of are, radicals' what imaginations. What were these two operations? These were um, surveillance gathering and counterintelligence programs, internal, domestic, what do they call it, domestic surveillance programs uh, aimed primarily um, at Indian people, uh, specifically after the Wounded Knee Siege of 1973. From that point on, uh, I believe 74 and 75 was Operation Garden Plot and Operation Cable Splicer. It's documented if people read, and especially on college campuses where we think people read, but somehow they don't read what, what's out there in the world. People need to read. Now, there's many books on, on domestic surveillance, on counterintelligence programs, I mean, the Fred Hampton case. Those were real cases where police agencies violated civil and human rights and even, according to their own ethics, violated law enforcement eth codes of ethics. People need to understand that that's true, those are facts, and if they ever allow us, for example, in the case of Leonard Peltier, very soon, we hope to prove that. We hope to prove to people that, that the government, the FBI, 
and local levels of police agencies do commit crimes, do violate the law, and many times convict people um, unjustly and illegally. We had a two-part series on the Greensboro, North Carolina murders of the labor organizers where it was revealed that the FBI and the local police, etc., actually instigated the violence, actually sure. infiltrated these different groups and themselves began the violence. Isn't there a parallel here to the Peltier case and the Wounded Knee case where it's not that the Indians instigated the violence, but rather the FBI themselves began that? Do you have some information? Well, yes, we do. And, and the most uh, glaring example that we have, of course, is Douglas Durham, who infiltrated the American Indian Movement. And uh, we have uh, part of the Amnesty International report regarding uh, the American Indian Movement and the FBI. Uh, and I was just reading here, whereby uh, documented already uh, is Douglas Durham's case. Douglas Durham got to be in leadership, or got next to the leadership of the American Indian Movement. Today, Douglas Durham, after he was uncovered as, as an informant of the FBI, is today a very, um, not wealthy, but very, uh, you know, comfortable uh, person who travels on the college circuit uh, and also paid by the John Birch Society to discredit uh, groups that are active action groups, social action, political activist groups, progressive organizations to discredit their work and, 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 uh, you know, he's now supported and financed by the John Birch Society, and, and we understand that connection, too, with all the other agencies. So, again, like you say, there's very similar And he parallels. actually instigated the violence, this Durham. He, of course. He, he would, infiltrated the groups and He would find the explosives. He would find the, right. you know, he would come up with the clever ideas, uh, and the same thing in Leonard. And, and they knew who was traveling where, when people were going to do this and that. They just had it down pat. What's been the reaction of the mass media and all that. You never see anything in the re regular press about Leonard Peltier or what's really going on to the Native American people. Well, we have, well, we have, we, we do have some developments working w with such as contracts with 20th Century Fox to do movies on a portrayal in Leonard's life, okay, as well as to give some, some uh, accounts of the oppression and the movement and what the people were fighting for. There's a book coming out, too. We have it? a major novel that is now into the publisher. It's called the Crazy, uh, Spirit of Crazy Horse, or either Crazy Horse Spirit. And it'll be a story on Leonard's life. And again, it'll be given actual times, mm -hmm. dates, places, and experiences, and all the actual names of everybody is involved into the book. And Robert uh, we, Redford is the one who is uh, primarily interested in doing a movie on it. Yeah, he's, he's, doing a lot of, he, he's doing a lot of his own investigations right now really researching the movie because uh, right now I think our commitments are getting stronger to where he will probably want to produce and direct the movie for us. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we, in our contracts, we're open to really anybody who we want to choose that will tell the truth in the best way it can be told on okay. film. You what know? about uh, network television? The 60 Minutes, for instance, done anything? Well, but presently, did, uh, this year's part of the work of building the awareness for Leonard is to get a lot of the American people to write letters to 60 Minutes to have them take an interest in the Peltier story, such as to Paul Lowenwater, who works within uh, the, the network. Uh, Phil Donahue, you know, uh, we have connections into ABC Close Up. People's Magazine came out a year ago in April with an article on Leonard that was very well. New Age Magazine. So uh, he's been in the Rolling Stones, he's been in the Village Voice, you know, so it is picking up on a lot of levels, but keeping it in the, me in the local media right now is the responsibilities that all the support groups that are having in their areas mm -hmm. right now, like, you asked about international support, you know, we, we have like over 40 support groups throughout the countries in Europe that are, have active groups going, okay. Uh, in the United States we have approximately 30 groups. And throughout this tour since March 8th, in which we've been on a constant, constant public awareness campaign to support the writ, we've established at least uh, 14 more groups to add to the national mm -hmm. level. See? So, I mean, we're building very rapidly, and we're, the most beautiful thing of all is, is to see the spirit of the people come together under serious issues such as Leonard and standing up to see the, the spirit that's generated to keep us going 
it is very strong. And really, you can only say so much because it's an invisible power that, that, that we're all looking for in reality, what unity really means, uh, what sharing, working together really means. And I really think through the experiences, we've came a long way because all people knew about before was that Leonard was put on the 10 most wanted list and he was a killer and people didn't want no part of it, you know? And now that we've been able to build awareness worldwide on him, it's growing to where people are becoming concerned that they're given a chance to hear the case. And that's the realities of it. And we just hope to just keep on in the manner that we're going. Our chances of Leonard winning the new trial is very positive. We don't want to think no other way. And we hope we can build a mass movement worldwide, such as we did with Angela Davis, to stop the Vietnam War, to stop the draft, because we're going to have to redo all these things again with how they got plans for people to do the draft again, you know, and they're going to be taking them. I mean, they're already messing with the people's, uh, the old people's blood, Social Security and pension checks that they're getting. And with the high prices of all the energies going up, you know, that we need for our lifestyles, I mean, people need to organize. They need to get together. And right now, I think one of the most important elements of life that people need to start learning is not just look at nature as a coincidence and things happen naturally but we have to start understanding on how we are a part of that survival and we have to start re learning and learning to respect and use those things together in the best way possible instead of putting prices on them and forget about the people if they couldn't follow this understanding of the policy and the education on how you take care of your needs then they don't have no way of surviving and then what do they do? They steal, they become alcoholics, and they just wind up committing suicide. They send them to institutions. I mean, we, we have a sick society because we got think people's got problems, and we set up different little programs, and now all those programs that are dealing with people's lives are being threatened through Reagan's madness or the nuclear energy. All the nuclear warheads going into, uh, into Europe, you know, is really incredible because right now they have enough to just to blow up the world, and if we allow the government to blow up the world, I mean, we're gone as people. The generations are no more. I mean, the earth will survive itself in time. You know, it, it'll, it'll be thousands of years before it'll regather its strength in order to have its natural strength again, you know. But what's going to happen to the people if we allow the uranium thing to go on? And I think examples such as are coming out of a lot of different uh, nuclear alliance groups, such as the one in Canada two years ago now, through testing of a mother moose, they had to find out why she gave birth to a two-headed moose. She was eating the vegetation life, and they found out from the testing that the uranium chemicals change their hormones. And if this can happen to an animal with two heads, what can happen to people in reality when we already know for 20 years in the community of Oglala, in the government housing that they put up, there's uranium chemicals in the wall in which people are affected by the outcome of that today. And it's just a matter of time on how it does away with each and every individual because the creations of the great mystery is really beautiful if we can just learn to look at it and evaluate it what it really has to offer and living with man-made laws that put prices on our natural rights to use the land and the air and the water is incredible you know that's taken away from a natural born right because our Indian people had a way of life in this land and today we're struggling to to hang on to that knowledge in order for these children to have a chance in the coming futures because you look at the, the government going into the space age, it's unbelievable where we can think we're going to be space people. You know, we're Earth people and we need the air and we need the water and we need the land. And we, we're going into un, un, unknown things that we should not tamper with, we, in a simple sense. We don't need to tamper with. Ever since they've been to the moon, the seasons have not been the same. It's been a big unbalance. And the earth is losing its energies because in our Indian beliefs, you just can't keep taking from the earth and taking and taking and taking, using up all those energies. Around the world, energy is being used 24 hours a day from the trucks, from the time they take it from the earth, putting it through the processes, transporting it to the people, getting it into the stores, the people going to work, getting their checks, buying these things that they need. And we look in time, where does it all go back? It goes back into the garbage that we've just polluted and contaminated and we destroy the earth. Simple process of understanding, but how, what do we do to change that? I think this is where we're at in understanding. We all got our differences, we've all got our lifestyles, our jobs that we believe in, what we're trying to learn to make a good future, uh, but that's just for our future. That's not for the children because they're going to be completely different also. You know, and to what, you know, a dream of what it was to live the life of my ancestor is a big hurt in many of our people that they just don't know how to express. 
So the only way they can express us is to sacrifice to society and that is destroying us and start learning what is really your roots, your language, the traditions on how you identify foods, when you hunt, when you fish. Today you can't do that because there's nothing to fish and there's nothing to hunt. And you got to have licenses and then when you get licensed you still got to pay for your hunt. You know, and there's so many processes. People hunt for, for, for game, for, for just enjoyment put trophies of animals that had a spirit, they put them on the wall, locking them into zoos. You look around the world today, flying in a plane, and you look down and you see all the land is cultivated into little squares where they've got fences. Everybody owns this. And see, it just lost the energy. See, when you keep taking from the earth and you build establishments such as this, Italy gives us a good example that the time just takes care of it. It's kind of, it, you know, we can re keep rebuilding it all we want. Time is going to take care of it. But is our children going to be able to carry on those, those uh, knowledges that we live by? But they're not true knowledges. They're destroying us, but yet we've all accepted it. You know, and we talk about Constitution, but the, the, the Constitution isn't it. It's natural born rights. From the time we are born, from the time we're in our mother's wombs in that water for nine months, we come out and breathe the air. We're already exposed to all this confusion out here when before we had a simple way of what the natural law was. See, the medicine world, taking somebody else's eye, somebody else's heart is incredible. And that we weren't born to do that. We weren't born to be dope addicts and shove needles down our throats and confuse our minds with alcohol just because we can't take care of our weaknesses and we have to entertain ourselves. We had ways and medicines. Everybody had a job. Everybody had a different little job that fitted in. Not everybody was a medicine man or a buffalo hunter, or not everybody can capture the eagle, which was a medicine of, of wisdom and knowledge. You know, was people like Sitting Bull, uh, who went a hundred years ago, tried to take his people into Canada because of the oppression that they were being forced on on the reservation, being massacred and everything else. And they captured him, brought him back into it. It's the same thing with Leonard Peltier, but only he couldn't take his people into Canada. They had, they're just struggling for the last remaining lands they have left, and it's right there at home. You know, and so this is the reality of it. I mean, we've been put on reservations. We're claiming various parts of the country, such as the Black Mesa for the Arizona, for the Navajo Hopi people. Over here for the six Iroquois nations, you got the New York State into Canada. And over here for us in South Dakota, it's the Black Hills. You know, just like it is for the people of the Northwest who are maintaining to keep the natural fish from becoming imitation fish from the enhancement through the fisheries program on how they're claiming the fish by clipping their nose from the time they take the egg, they rear them into little processes. When the fish get about this big, they take each and every one and put a metal clip in their nose. So they go out to the natural environment for four and a half years, come back to the natural ground, and when the fishermen catch the fish, they have to ticket it in the process. And, they have to, and this is how the government's claiming the fish. And they're only going to give you so much, you, you can't get the regular price. But see, those values there destroyed the traditional values of our people on the reservations over there because in the old day when an Indian person was fish, his, his, his first catch would go as a ceremony and an offering to the families or the spirits. And then his catch would come for what he needs to prepare for those winter months that are coming, see. I mean, we've lost all those concepts of sharing, trading, when we all have a natural right to use the air, the water, and all the foods that come with it, see? So I think these are serious things that the uranium madness is creating a threat to, you know, and it's one of the biggest things. And then the war is about the draft. In a natural sense, we weren't born into this world to have to fight wars for people. We were born on this world to live a life of peace somehow. We need to get back to that. <laughs> That's the reality of it, you know? And so it's been since days of old When Custer died for a mountain of gold But times have changed and passed them by They've been replaced by the FBI Oh, it's all so easy to weep and moan For a warfare fought so far from home You can preach of peace from a righteous stand But there ain't no peace on the Indian land was a lower down the winds did blow with a mighty sound and the answer came in the driving rain this man shall not have died in vain for 
For the hollow power of the lock and key Ain't nothing to the power of the raging sea For the lightning strikes in the angry skies That puts the power into people's eyes Oh, the weather is building to a mighty storm And the words in the wind that come to warn Are once more spoken to your ear Only this time the name is a Leonard Peltier have gone before and tell me how many more must be lost to the Indian War Duck Valley Indian Reservation, a Shoshone Paiute family of a nation in protest, burns in flames, dies in flames, while across the sky, the American Indian movement burns the imperialist flag on the lower steps of the white man's house. Looking Eagle loses his wife, the wind, loses sunshine, Ricardo Starr, and Eli Chasing Sun. But the wind still carries the star into the sky, and the sun is changing into the spirit of Crazy Horse. One does not sell the earth upon which the people walk. The land is still here. They did not steal it. They could not. A young one, not yet born, is lost in murderous flames as colonial agents descend upon the land with violence. It's our primary task. We will defend the land, defend the freedom of the open plains with flesh offerings on an angry body. For the indigenous family, the entire life is aflame. The veins are aflame, the heart is aflame, the eyes are aflame, the fist and the mind are aflame. One eagle feather sparks the sovereign prairie fire, and from D.C. to Duck Valley to Wounded Knee and Ogallala, the weapons of liberation are aflame. <laughs> 